welcome to first Indiana Robotics history of game design webcast. This is session one of five. We're going to go through different periods of uh, games in the first robotics competition. We're doing this as a resource for teams who are right now working on the fine details for their own game design challenge submissions for the 2021 season. Um, and we're providing this as context for anybody who's not familiar with um, a lot of the games or game concepts we've seen in, in the past. Uh, my name is Nick, and joining me today um, as my co-host is Liz Smith. Liz, tell us about yourself a little bit. Uh, so I am an alumna from Machina, New Jersey, and I'm currently mentoring the Cyber 2 3940 team from Kokomo, Indiana, and I'm also on the first Indiana board of directors as well. And I am also a co-mentor on uh, FRC team 3940 along with Liz. Um, and I actually grew up in Canada as an alumni of uh, FRC team 1503 Spartonics um, and bounced around a couple of the teams while I was in college and uh, ended up working in Indiana for Andy Mark as a mechanical systems designer. Throughout all of these shows are going to have a lot of really exciting and interesting guests. Um, we've done our best to twist the arms of some super famous people in first. Um, joining us today, we have Woody Flowers Award winner Chris Fultz and first robotics competition Andy Diaz. About yourself, please. Hi. Um, yeah, Chris Fultz. I'm a mentor on uh, Cyber Blue Team 234. Been a mentor since 2001. And uh, right now I'm the lead mentor for that team. Um, Woody Flowers Award winner from 2010 and have been part of Indiana First and the board and now on the executive advisory. Um, when I'm not doing first, I work for Rolls Royce. So uh, we have, as a technology company, a real strong interest in. First Robotics and sponsor a lot of teams that are very engaged. Awesome. We're super happy to have you here, Chris. And Danny, tell us about yourself. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm Danny Diaz. I'm a systems engineer with First Robotics Competition. I've been a, a little bit of everything, um, but I've been involved in First um, since 2003 um, as a uh, um, you know, cross program. So first Lego league, first tech challenge, uh, first robotics competition. Um, I, I live and breathe this stuff. This is great. Awesome. Thanks for joining us today as well. We're really excited to have you guys. Um, you're a bunch of super smart guys and we're really excited to learn about these, um, these games. Speaking of the games, today's session will cover the very beginning of the first robotics competition. Um, this is where things are a little weird, um, where things changed a lot season to season. We're going to cover the games from 1992, the very first season, um, way back in a little high school in Manchester, New Hampshire, all the way up to 2000. Um, as we said, this is the infancy of first, where a lot of things that we have today, um, we, we take for granted. Everything from driving on carpet to wireless robot control. Um, this is like the cutting edge of robot technology, and it's it really was a fun time. This is where we see a lot of big swinging changes to games, and it's it's going to be a, a fun ride. I'm really, really excited to go over all of these games. And with that, let's talk about our first game, 1992. So one of the things uh, to think about just, you know, as you're designing your own games and then when you're looking at these is it's important to design to the available technology and available capability. So you're going to see some things and wonder, you know, why they did that or why teams couldn't do certain things. You know, the motor capability, the control system capability, um, just the electronics that were available, sensors have really evolved. So what that means for you today is make sure that the game you're designing is using technology that is readily available to teams and not something that, you know, a real small percentage of teams would even have the potential to pursue. So you want to make sure um, they're challenging, but also that it's available technology for, for a pretty wide audience. And don't be afraid to raise the bar. Um, I know that was the name of uh, 2004's game, uh, First Frenzy, but don't forget, you know, robots who uh, are, are using the base cat, kit chassis. Uh, the base kit chassis is a fundamental element uh, in building robots and designing games and figuring out exactly what all robots can do in the game. But if you've got a game mechanism or a game element where you might need to raise the bar and add something to that kit chassis, uh, don't be afraid to do that, you know, to suggest, hey, we need blank in this kit so that all teams can have access to you know this one element so you know be creative and raise the bar if you need to 
and that yeah. forced technology development is a big deal. I mean, that when it's designed into games and done well, it, it raises the floor of the competition where everybody is exposed to X, Y, Z new thing. Um, anything from, you know, line following division processing, it eventually raises the floor where everybody kind of gets good at those things, which is great. So I know a lot of the students and even some of the mentors uh, weren't even alive in uh, 1992. Um, and I know that that was also before um, you guys were on, on Teams, but what can you tell us about some of the technologies and, and what was going on back in 1992 for the Maze Craze game? Okay, so Maze Craze uh, was played, there was only one competition that year. Uh, was a 16 foot square floor and had between one and two inches of corn um, spread all over it. So uh, really difficult surface. Uh, the robots were pretty slow moving. Um, just just a lot of challenges. You picked up tennis balls. Uh, some were one some were on post. Some were just laying there, and you had to move those back and forth. Um, one thing interesting from a technology perspective is the robots were tethered. So uh, you had to not only pay attention to the field and other robots, but you had to pay attention to where your tether was, make sure it wasn't going to get tangled in something or run over by somebody. So uh, an added little bit of uh, challenge there. But the field itself was relatively small compared to what we have today. Yeah, and one of the, the major elements in game design is realizing how many degrees of freedom a particular robot has to have in order to be able to play this game. Uh, here in Maze Craze, the vast majority of the scoring happened on the floor, right? You were picking up uh, these one-point tennis balls up off the floor. However, the tennis balls, like Chris said, were on posts, some of the, the high-point tennis balls. There was only about five high-point tennis balls, but those five high-point tennis balls were uh, one foot, two foot, and three feet up in the air. So robots had to be able to somehow get those balls either down or uh, reach up and grab them. And one of the really interesting things about game design is if you provide a game challenge, somebody's probably going to solve that challenge in a way that you didn't expect and probably didn't want to have happen. Uh, one of the examples that Andy Baker gave us from that particular year was a a uh, an air compressed projectile so somebody really smart was able to figure out how to build an air compressor out of that kit of parts then have a projectile that was really dangerous but it shot up and knocked the, the ball off the pedestal now that solution was immediately deemed illegal <laughs> so that's why we have so many pneumatics rules now uh, that's we'll gonna compete yeah. <laughs> you can thank the, all the people who came before you uh, why you can't do all the crazy things that you want to do because if it's been crazy, it's probably been done. And, and Chris, you talked a lot about technology yeah. development. Um, mm -hmm. The robots were really small in this game, right? Yeah, the robots were um, trying to look and see 13 by 15 by 19 inches, um, a very restrictive kit of parts. Uh, very restrictive on where you could get materials, um, so it was it was a challenge. Also, for that game, they did not have their own battery, so power came through that tether. And one interesting point we learned is initially it was a six volt power source coming to the robots, but playing in the corn and doing all that, they really were underpowered. So it was kind of a game time decision, so to speak, to bump that up to eight volts. So suddenly. Uh, robot performance stepped up and it made the game much more interesting. So that's the kind of thing where you learn. And in this case, uh, you know, where now we might see a real change between regionals or week to week. In this case, there was only one event. So that real change and in power increase happened real time and everybody took advantage of it right away. That's really interesting. And uh, one of the points you mentioned is uh, being interesting to watch, right? If the robots are really slow, I know that's an important aspect of game design is what the audience sees when they watch the game. Um, maybe Danny, mm -hmm. is there some something you can speak to about that? I know that's something you consider um, for for current games as well. Yeah, we uh, we always highlight 
uh, being able to, to give like an elevator speech to somebody in describing what the game is. You know, you've always got, you know, grandma in the stands who really doesn't understand the game. Um, and when you're watching the game, it's really hard sometimes to just understand what's going on, especially when you've got action going on in multiple different places. It's one of the things I really liked about Maze Craze is that most of the action was was there in the center of the field. Um, and so you could you could see what was going on with the robots. It was a relatively small field. So depending on where you were sitting, they didn't really have stands necessarily back then um, in, inside the gymnasium and everybody was kind of huddled up next to the, to the field, but you could still see what was going on for the vast majority of, of the, the gameplay. So I really liked that uh, from an audience perspective um, and being able to see what was going on and also just from a, uh, a, an, a I don't know, an aesthetic perspective, um, it actually looked really cool to see all that corn on the field. That, that must have been some, right. you know, Redenbacher's uh, nightmare. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, Liz, the other thing to that point is today, you know, we've got the ability to do CAD models and you can do, you know, the perspective and what's the view look like from different seats in the stands and from the side and from a referee perspective, all those you know, back in these early games, you didn't really have that capability so much. So you had to more visualize what are people going to be able to see and see around where today you can, you know, really create it and say, you know what, it'd look better if this element was on this side of the field or if this tower was moved a little bit. So another thing to really consider when you're designing a game is the audience. What are they going to be able to see to help them understand what's going on? You know, if they can't see the game element being scored, it's hard to know what just happened that the score went up by 10 points. So. And on that, I love that point. That, that's a, a very fantastic point. One of the things that we also try to, you know, something in the back of our minds as we're playing games or watching games is being able to see what's going on um, it, during the game within a robot, right? You don't know how many game pieces a particular robot has. So, you know, it's basically a black box down there. Um, this game was a little bit odd um, or, or difficult in a sense because all of the balls were the same, right? They're all the same size. They're all the same shape, um, but they're just slightly different colors. And so depending on how the balls were in the robots, you couldn't tell which robot had that 25-point bonus ball. You couldn't tell who had additional 10-point bonus balls. So when you're looking at the robot, if you see a robot with a bunch of balls inside of it, you kind of hope that's the one who's winning, you know, when you're trying to figure out, hey, who's winning the game? Danny, tell us a little bit more about Rug Rage and what made that game so interesting. Yeah, Rug Rage. It was uh, the hall in The Shining. Um, <laughs> basically, you had this this long strip of carpet, and there were four goals um, on sort of the ends of um, the carpet, and then a bunch of uh, balls. There were two different kinds of balls. You had 13-inch uh, red balls, and you had uh, smaller, I think, four or five-inch small balls. But the... Uh, the goal of the game, you know, you had these robots who were set sort of like the twins and the shining um, on e either end of the hallway. And then they all kind of descended upon that middle section, trying to grab as many balls as possible and put into their goal areas. Uh, it was really cool because the goal uh, could actually handle the small balls, which, to be honest with you, was the, the very first water element um, used in, in robotics history because the balls were actually filled with water, which made them kind of interesting to move around on the floor. And those balls could actually go into the goal because there was a little uh, uh, entrance um, set up on the, the goal that the small balls could easily fit through, but the larger balls would not. And that, that's, that's, a, that's a challenge right there when you're thinking of designing a game of when you're thinking about like aspect ratio of game pieces versus their scoring elements, right? The, the size of the field with the size of the game piece and how much room you have to move around because that, that strip of carpet was only about three robots wide. So when you have the game pieces and the robots all in a very small area, it made it very difficult for robots to actually do anything and go anywhere. They were constantly fighting in the center of the field. And Chris, uh, speaking of the field yeah. itself, this was the first yeah. time that we saw carpet as a surface, which is a drastic change from driving on corn. Um, you want to talk a little yes. bit more about the, the field itself? And 
Yeah, so a couple interesting things. If you if you look at the field, um, there's not really a significant field border. Um, it's just like looks like half a piece of PVC pipe laying there, um, which you know we wouldn't do that today. A couple reasons for that. One, you know, the robots they were smaller, they were lighter. Um, also, just from a power perspective, so the the motor people used for drive was a seat motor, um, which a lot of teams won't even use today because of the power, um, which isn't much. So a uh, seat motor output was 18 watts. As a comparison, a sim, single sim is about 337 watts. So almost 20 times that in one motor. We now use, you know, two, four, six of those on a drive. Well, at, at that time, you could probably just use two on your drive. So robots move a little slower, much less power. So there was less concern about a robot actually getting over that that game border so it was made for the field much better visibility there was you know no no borders and things in the way uh, but part of that was from a safety perspective you didn't really need that and that played well right into uh being able to start all the game pieces in the center of the field i can't imagine having uh, a modern first or box competition game where all of the game pieces are in the center of the field and everybody makes a mad rush um whereas that that works with um robots with you know a 20th of the drive power we have now where they're right, not right playing ultimate destructo yeah i think the other the, the other thing and and we'll talk about it more as 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 we get into some of these other games was that not only were you very limited on power but you had to make your own gearbox if you wanted a gearbox you had to go figure it out you couldn't you know go to vex.com or andy mark or someone else and just say i need a gearbox this spec that this motor will bolt to and then go work on everything else you had to do all that design yourself. So not only low power, but difficult to get a very efficient gearbox there and connect things to it. So uh, a lot of challenges just in the mechanical aspects, besides the, you know, the challenges of the game, just a lot of mechanical challenges of building a robot that would, you know, stay together and, and play through a whole competition. Yeah, that's a great point, Chris, because a lot of people don't realize that at this point in the game, um, extrusion isn't legal yet. You know, if you wanted to buy um, a gear, you could only buy a gear from the small, unless you were making it yourself out of wood, you could only buy parts from the company small parts. They, they had a small parts catalog. It's not just, you know, any catalog with small parts. It was the small parts catalog that you could actually buy things out of. And so that was the only real vendor that you could buy uh, parts for your robot from other than Home Depot, which I I'm pretty sure Home Depot was a thing. Back then. <laughs> <laughs> there, but I'm not I sure if they were. Yeah. Yeah. And this Somebody in the chat will look that up. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, I feel like this is kind of still the start of looking like a first game, though. There's still some elements that you know, look like they could be maybe expanded on, but translate to you know, future years out there, which mm -hmm. is kind of exciting. Yeah, one of the things that um, really, you know, we, we, we see a lot more of after uh, Rug Rage is, you know, having a small ball versus a large ball, you know, having two different sizes that the robots have to be able to deal with. You know, in this particular game, the small balls could be herded. And, and really, in this game, because of the weight of the balls, uh, with all the water inside of them, those small balls really almost had to be herded um, along the floor because the robots just didn't have the power. And the, the, the red, as I mentioned before, the red balls had to be collected. So robots had to be able to lift those, those uh, red balls up to be able to get into the goal. And so that's a, a common trope that you'll see um, throughout FRC, where you have multiple different game pieces of different size, even though they might be the same thing, right? They're all balls, uh, but they're just different sizes that your robot, you know, has to have a different way of, of managing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a, um, we'll talk, you know, off and on through the whole thing, but you talk about trade-off of opportunities. So you may have had to decide, are we going to have a robot that can just push, or are we going to put the effort into one that can pick up these other ones and move them around? And um, as you, you know, work through all the games and as you work on even designing your own, you always want to make the game so the teams have to make those trade-offs and they have to, you know, do that evaluation, the critical thinking and decide, okay, we're going to, we can do A and B, 
but we can't do A, B, and C. So we'll make that make that decision based on you know our capabilities or um, what you know what's available. Um, so you always want to think about forcing a team to to make those difficult choices and doing that evaluation of what the most value is for them. And, and not only does that make a really educational experience uh, for the teams to have to make those tough choices, it also makes games interesting where not every single robot looks the same, right? Right, right, for sure. And I, the last thing I want to mention, um, since we're still talking about, you know, different robots doing different things and, and being able to, to manage these game pieces, um, one of the things, so I'm, I'm also a mentor for, um, uh, you know, a couple of robotics teams, I just, you know, remote mentors, if you will. And um, a couple of teams are, are working on game design and they've kind of, you know, showed me, hey, this is kind of what we're thinking about. Um, you know, are these worth doing? And one of the things that they, um, that all the teams have done so far is they've immediately, very early in the process, assigned points to game pieces. Um, you know, for us, that's the last thing we do because we know how important it is to just, you know, get the get the concepts right, get the the gameplay right, and then um, we have a very huge long process of coming up with you know the right point values. Um, here in Rug Rage, I think they may have you know done a, a huge disservice um, to get with those point values. Um, the large balls, but there are like five large balls. Um, were worth five points apiece, which there was only 20 small balls worth one point apiece. So, you know, the, there was a huge difference in the point values and the scoring and uh, how many game pieces each robot would even be able to grab. So if you were able to somehow grab three of those in those large red balls, which, you know, there was a, there were robots who could do that, you were almost guaranteed to win the game. You know, if they had just saved it a little bit and then said, okay, maybe these large balls are worth three points, it would have been a very different game that year. So when you're when you're designing your games, save those those point evaluations. You know, just don't try to put a point value on them. Just work on gameplay first. Yeah, that makes total sense because it's it's easier to get those points right when you have more of the mechanics figured out. Um, okay. Okay, so uh, keeping things going here, um, on to 1994, we grew to 44 teams uh, and played Tower Power. Chris, tell us about this game a little bit. All right, so Tower Power, um, this year, the, the, it was a carpeted floor, again. Uh, it's called a 12-gon, so basically a 12-sided playing field. The center was a hexagon scoring area, and there were two levels. If you look at the pictures there, that, that centerpiece in the middle, that game element, looks kind of familiar to some other game elements that we saw, you know, later in first. So, you know, kind of the, the message there is don't be afraid to reuse or repurpose or, you know, slightly adapt something that's been used in the past if it's been effective. Um, because that that kind of tower with with some different ways to score on it, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see that some, some more times during this uh, 20 years of, of game history. Um, the balls were specific color to an alliance, so you collected those and then uh, would score those, you know, in, in that center element. So uh, a lot of robot activity, a lot of, you know, picking up the balls scored, you know, try to get them up in that, up in that top. Um, there was only one game piece for this one. Uh, it was a soccer ball size, so, you know, everybody was playing with the same size. Uh, just different colors depending on your alliance. And and Danny, one of the things that we're going to see a lot of here is a lot of different ways that you can get to a winner. Um, and this game is unique in the sense that you would play your your qualification rounds with three robots, but your finals, you went down to two robots. Can you talk a little bit more about like how that's weird and such? Yeah, that's that's kind of weird when you got three rope. You know, you these games um, starting here in Tower Power were one on one on one. You know, previously you had um, Maze Craze, which had four robots, so you had four robots um, going. You know, at it on the field at the same time. Um, there in uh, Rug Rage, um, you had you know four robots, and then now we have three robots, which is kind of interesting. Um, three robots doesn't seem like it would be that 
that weird, but what actually ends up turning out um, uh, through gameplay was that it ended up being more of a two-on-one. If you had one robot that was really super powerful, um, there was a lot of cl- – it's really hard not to want to do some kind of collusion. You know, hey, if you hold that robot down, uh, that'll help us both, but then we'll score and we'll sort of slow them down. So what ends up happening is during qualification play, you'll – you know, no matter how much you try not to have it, you're going to get some kind of collusion. You're going to have, you know, somebody wanting to slow down the really good robot and then somebody else, you know, the third wheel, uh, either by collusion themselves or just by the luck of the draw that, hey, they just happen to be on the field. And, you know, when you got two robots that are going at each other, you're completely free to do whatever you want. And then you're able to score as many balls as you want. So in the finals, instead of being allowed to have that, you know, collusion possibility, uh, that's when they decided to just go one-on-one uh, there in the finals. Yeah, that makes a bunch of sense. Yeah, so something else, you know, interesting with this game and something to think about and consider, once one of these balls was scored, it was done. So if you scored it, you know, for the, for the low, low point, that, that was it. You couldn't, you know, get it and score it again. So... Um, depending on where that ball was placed, it had different point values. A lot of games now, the, whatever that scoring element is, will get recycled. It can come back into play. You know, in this game, once it was scored, it was it was done. Um, and also, what that meant is, once you started scoring, you had to do more chasing, so more driving to find where that next next uh, ball was for you to be able to pick up and score. So uh, sometimes you want to think about in the game design that type of thing where the next score is more difficult than the one before, um, maybe because, you know, the number of balls gets smaller. Also, you know, in this one, as that top part of that tower got filled up, the next ball going in might bounce out because it hit two or three other balls. So there's things you can do from your design strategy of the game that can make it progressively more difficult to score as you, as you proceed. Yeah, we call that reverse, sort of reverse eight ball. You know, you've got eight ball, which means that, you know, sort of like when you're playing uh, eight ball, you know, billiards, you're playing eight ball. um, And once you start clearing away the field, it becomes easier and easier to make shots. In reverse eight ball, once you start scoring, it makes it harder and harder to be able to score the next ball. Um, And as we'll see in future games, um, you know, the goals maybe doesn't don't hold all the game pieces. You know, when you've got three robots shooting in um, the the soccer balls, those soccer balls, they all fit, but they just barely fit. Yeah, definitely. Just um, a little bit of tweaking on on geometry will make a big impact for how the later stages of, of higher gameplay matches go. Um, right, right. And that, that, that's super interesting to me of, of like the balance. Um, when, I, when I think about game design, the balance of available game pieces versus scoring locations, um, like one swing of a little bit either way makes a really big impact on the later stages of match play for sure. Yeah, and some of those right. things that you can adjust are the size of the goal, the size of the game piece, the number of game pieces, and all those Factors really need to balance with each other to make a, a good a good game overall. I think um, one right. one thing I want to point out so far, um, uh, Chris, is that this is the the third game we've talked about and the third totally different shape of field. Um, you you let in and kind of like talked about it's a twelve sided field, but this is totally a different shape again of the field. Right, and I think maybe that was partly because there weren't that many events, um, there weren't that many teams. So you weren't worried about, okay, how do we pack this up and ship it and put it together at the next place so it looks just like it did before? You know, so you didn't have some of those logistics. Um, So you you probably had a lot more freedom. You didn't have huge amounts of money invested in fields and perimeters and all that. Um, You didn't have a lot invested in, in trucking and logistics of how to move those things around. You know, if you think about, you know, let's say the game, and I think actually first said one of the rules for the game design challenge was it has to use roughly today's size field. If somebody came in and said, I have this awesome game and it's circular, that might be a really cool game, but that means every field that exists is no longer good. And you have to do a whole new field design, figure out how to put it together, get all those instructions, get all of them made so that they can then ship not only around the U.S., but around the world. So you know, that was one thing kind of early on that wasn't as big of a deal. You were just maybe driving it up the road to a different high school because it was just one or two events each year. 
That's actually a, a good point um, from game design perspective and field design. Um, that sort of spurred, you know, a thought here that um, when you're designing your, your fields and you're designing the things that go inside of your field, you know, being able to, to take it to different places um, is a, a huge challenge. Um, you know, a lot of times we will design something and then eventually say, there's no way we can either ship this, pack this, move this, um, or, you know, even sometimes as in 2019, you know, there's no way we can actually do this safely. Um, but uh, for robots, whenever you're, you're building field elements on the field, you know, the robots have to be able to interact with them. Here in Tower Power, which was the first time that this has really been done, um, there's an uneven floor surface. Right. I mean, yeah. So the corn, you know, in the maze. Yeah. OK. So you had uneven areas of the floor. But here you've got actual literal bumps that the robots have to be able to, to, to navigate over. Um, it, it almost kind of feels like 2016 all over again. Yeah, definitely. This 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 game is like the first one I remember watching an ESPN broadcast for mm -hmm. um, where uh, first was getting a lot of momentum at this point um, within you know the professional community. And starting to build that, that that following of hey, competitive robots could be a sport, um, and a simplistic field, you know, like this makes it really easy to. Um, it, we talked about this a little bit already, but a field that is really simple to explain makes it easy to sell um, exactly right. both what's going on in the game, but sell the program itself. Yes. Yeah, I'm just I'm just really amazed that you remember watching ESPN when you were one. <laughs> <laughs> they had reruns or something. I definitely remember watching Something. this game on the television. I was not one, but it was like maybe three or four. I remember watching uh, it. it definitely. So yep. in Canada, yes. <laughs> so we had a little bit of terrain to deal with in uh, 1994. Fast forward a year to Ramp and Roll in 1995. It's in the name. There was a ton of terrain to deal with in this game. Dan, you want to talk a little bit about the kind of the craziness that this field was? Yeah, Nick, this was an absolute bonkers field. Uh, similar to uh, the, the 1993 uh, Rug Rage, it really was kind of a, a strip of carpet, but this strip of carpet had some evil stuff on the ends. Um, the strip of carpet uh, had a, uh, an, a little area in the middle of the field that the robots had to, to be able to navigate over, which was a little bit of foreshadowing to what was at the end of the field, which was this this huge elevated inclined football goalpost. Um, it was up on this uh, pyramid shaped thing that that uh, the goalpost was like nine, eight or nine feet up in the air. Um, and the robots had to climb about six feet of that in order to get up to the goalpost. Um, what was kind of funny about that year is that robots would were, were constantly uh, falling off or rolling down the, not just rolling on their wheels, like literally tumble, tumbleweeding uh, down the, uh, the, the platform. That was an incredibly cool uh, setup for a competition field. Um, one of the, the field designs that we really haven't seen since. Yeah, and there were, so there were a couple unique elements to this game that um, we, we've seen come back. So one, there was no high score there was no highest score. You could continue to score the game element. So it's, you know, quick as you could score it, um, you could score again. However, there was a, a way to break this game, so to speak. If you could drive up the ramp and then just push the ball over the goal and bring it back and push it over and bring it back, you got a score every time you did that. So um, there wasn't a rule that said you had to let go of the ball to get those points. So um, it, it was difficult to do, you know, you're up, you know, up on the ramp, you're at an incline, you got this big heavy ball there. So um, it wasn't an easy thing to do, but it was one where um, with all the right capabilities, you could effectively break the game and score in a way that uh, the game committee probably didn't envision, or they would have, you know, put something in there to prohibit that kind of scoring. But that was a potential way of, of really, um, running up the score pretty quickly if you could do that. 
And I want to draw a parallel here to what actually ended up happening with one of the every bots in the infinite recharge at home uh, this season. You know, the, the one of the every bots was taking the ball. Um, they, they were doing uh, one of the, the skills challenges. So what you're doing is you're actually shooting the balls um, or you're supposed to, we thought you were going to be shooting the balls um, into the targets on the side of the field. Well, some enterprising people read the rules and then looked at it and said, oh, we could just take the ball and, and, and bounce the ball off the wall and just constantly bounce the ball off the wall and keep scoring. Well, that's not really what we had, you know, we really never thought you would do that here in this game. This is exactly what happened is the, the, I'm sure the, the game design committee didn't think that teams would be doing this, but hey, per the rules, it's pretty legal. Um, you know, we have the opportunity to see all of these teams trying to do this before, you know, an actual competition, you know, either in, you know, pre-match play in um, you know, practicing people will, you know, just put up video of, hey, we found a way to break the, the you know, we can't stop teams. It, it's actually kind of nice. Teams will just say, hey, we found a way to break the rules. And, you know, then we would immediately, you know, in the Q&A, go in and fix it. You know, it's like, oh, gosh, that's not what we wanted to do. That makes the game completely boring to watch. Um, this is definitely not how we want this game played. And then we'll change the rule and we'll fix it. And if we can, you know, get those, those rule changes as fast as possible, you know, the better. Here, you only had two competitions. You know, you had a 32-team event um, at Memorial High School, and then you had 48 teams at Epcot. And really, you know, making these these game time changes, you know, after robots have already been designed and built and tested, and then they're they're ready to come out and play, is almost impossible. Um, you know, you unless it's a, a massive safety thing, you don't typically change the rules at a competition. Um, you know. Uh, as long as one robot isn't on top of another robot, um, which we'll talk about later, probably. Uh, so, so here in this this particular year, you know, they had to pretty much let it happen, um, and and that was a, a big blow, probably, to the game design committee. Go ahead. Well, this was this was another year. It was, you know, one v one v one. So you had the potential of you know collusion and and teaming up on on the tougher or the the best team there, but then. Uh, it went to the one versus one in finals. So it was, you know, hopefully, you know, the two best teams just playing head to head at that point, but still the challenge during the, the qualification matches. Yeah. You know, all of the, the robots um, or all the tournaments that are one V one V one. And there's, there's a five one V one V one games. And they all have had the same issues um, where you had, um, you know, three three robots which ended up turning into a 2v1 um, and then that you had a little bit more pure finals where you had one-on-one -on -one. so one one thing i want to talk about or touch on with this game uh with rank and roll is this is as far as i know this is the first time where first branding actually appears on a game field um whereas the previous games didn't have a first logo and were you know maybe not as pretty as the rank and roll field um danny this is a thing you you deal with as part of your day job um this this is kind of a big deal to me. This is like the 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 seed of okay, first branding should actually appear in the field too. Yeah, you know that was um, uh, an interesting thing because I I didn't really realize that I said it to myself, but now that you mentioned that, I did say to myself, "Boy, this is a this is a very pretty field. This is a very uh, you know you know what you're looking at when you're looking at this field. Um, in previous fields, you didn't know what you were looking at, um, and and it was really." You know, something that uh, that we try to do in our games to you know, really promote sort of the theme or the feeling. Um, but we we now have first logos that go onto the field. We potentially even have sponsor logos. You know, if we have a season sponsor, uh, you know, Boeing was our first season sponsor back in 2019, and we had um, the the Boeing logo. You know, on the back of the uh, the the airships, the the airships, the <laughs> the rockets. And then in uh, Infinite Recharge, you know, we had um, all of the uh, the logos, you know, that were up there with the Star Wars, you know, Force for Change, um, that that were in a couple of places. And so, yeah, you got you got the branding, you got the, all of this for really almost for you know trying to to get 
uh, video sponsorship. You know, um, one of the things that that Dean loves to say is that first is a uh, uh, the most popular unknown game of the, you know, of the century. Um, it, cause uh, there's, there's so many places where first isn't where it should be. You know, we really, you know, we were on ESPN, um, you know, back in the day, um, and it'd be nice to go back. And when you look at, you know, video from these, it's nice to be able to say, Hey, that's a first game, um, versus all the other competitions that, you know, I, I'm not going to name any of the other, uh, competitions, but, you know, versus any of the other competitions, um, our fields are generally pretty, pretty, you know, they look good, but just remember that it's really expensive to put, you know, <laughs> extra vinyl and, and extra color, color this and color that, um, on, on a field. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, this is definitely the, the first game that to me looks really pretty. But um, I also think the next game, um, Hexagon Havoc in 1996, where we grew from like what 59 to 94 teams. Um, Chris, lead us off with what this uh, this game was all about. Okay, so this, uh, like you said, a lot a lot of teams. There was a big growth that year. It's a carpeted floor, and we're back to a hexagon field, and there's a kind of a center scoring area with a tower. Uh, you had two sizes of balls, large and small. And what was really interesting, if you look at the pictures, the human players were right by the edge of the field. They were seated. They had to wear like a seat belt to strap down so that they couldn't get up. And they could score, but they had to throw the balls over this kind of, kind of scoring bar. They had to throw them over that to get them into the field of play. So um, a lot of major uh, participation from the human player. Um, but again, kind of interesting how close to the field they are with robots and game pieces and all those things coming around. So just, you know, kind of different from the perspective of, you know, where can we put people and where can we not put people and how do we separate, you know, the people from the, the robots and the game elements and all that. Um, so really interesting from there. Um, yeah, speaking of human players, this is the first. You know, this was the first game with human players um, who actually took part in the game. And what what really surprises me is how much human player work they actually did. I mean, not only did they introduce the concept of human players, but they completely uh, took this game and allowed the human players to do an amazing amount of work on the field. You know, human players could actually receive game pieces from the field. You know, the robots could push the game pieces over to them, not just their game pieces, but other alliances game pieces too, if they wanted to, um, and throw them back onto the field. Um, the human players could also hold on to those game pieces indefinitely if they wanted to um, but they could also take those game pieces and yeah score them so uh, and, and actually hand them back to the robot if they wanted to hand them back to the robot there was a lot that was going on there with the human players in the first year that human players um, were there though I don't know that we uh, we would want to ever do the seat belts again, um, though I guess we did do the seat belts once once more time uh, back in what 2009. It just the human player aspect here was was phenomenal uh, and was a game changer. And and Chris, one thing that I want to touch on with you, uh, you being a a longtime drive coach for 234, is when I see in this picture, I see the human player is like totally separated. Um, from from their the rest of their drive team, um, I can imagine there's a bit of a bit of shouting that happened for coordination. Yeah, I think you'd have to either shouting or hand signals. Um, it would be you know really tough to be able to communicate that way. You know, some of the games now where the human player is at the other end of the field, you know, you have to to work out signals of you know one arm, two arm, things like that. So um, this would be a game where you very much would have to. Um, quickly establish a good way to coordinate, hey, we're bringing this ball over, we want you to keep it, or we're coming over, give us one, uh, because it, it would be real hard, you know, for the human player to know what strategy was was coming up next. Another another interesting, and, and some of the other games have this as well, you could de-score. So a human player could de-score, a robot could de-score. Um, that's something we've kind of moved away from in more recent games to where um, if someone's put the effort into scoring that game piece, you don't want to make it easy for someone to 
effectively take those points away. Um, but in this game and and some of the other ones, somebody could put a game piece up and you could you could take it away, uh, quickly eliminate those points for for that alliance or actually just that team. Right. Yeah, and it actually uh, plays a, a bigger um, a bigger element of the game, probably in future games. Um, but at least in in this particular game, um, you know, you had these these huge uh, balls uh, on the field, and not all the balls actually fit inside the goal. And so, if you could actually go in and have a robot actually de-score one of those game pieces in the middle of the field in in that goal that was absolutely huge you know every there's there's six large balls on the field and the point values they're pretty large you know you had 10 points um, for a, a large ball and three points for a small ball so if you could actually get both of your uh, large balls in there and actually keep them in um, that was a, a huge uh, swing in points to, to almost guarantee your win. And that's right. pretty interesting that you're starting to kind of bring in other robot actions that are not necessarily actively scoring game pieces, but doing other actions to contribute to game play uh, by de-scoring or uh, delivering to a human player or uh, right. things like that, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, when it comes to de-scoring, uh, I think this is the, the first game you know, well, this was definitely the first game that human players um, had the ability to affect it. I mean, uh, in the rules for um, two, for for 1993 in uh, uh, Rug Rage, there were elements of being able to de-score uh, balls out of the the scoring elements, the uh, out of the goals. But here, you actually and and you probably didn't see a whole in the videos that I watched. You didn't see a whole lot of that happen, but here, e almost every match, um, the, the the game pieces were being descored, and not only were they being descored by robots, they were mostly being descored by the human players, which will is sort of a little bit of foreshadowing to some of the the games that are coming up, where humans are actually doing most of the descoring. This game is definitely pretty pretty interesting. We've had a lot of games with balls. Every every game so far we've covered with balls. Turn the page over to Toroid Terror. It's in the name as well. Suddenly, we don't have any, um, you know, ball spherical game pieces anymore. In '97, we we have a totally new thing to deal with. Um, Danny, do you want to lead us off with this uh, this game? Yeah, I love Toroid Terror. Toroid Terror um, feel, you know, look. It's almost like watching Star Wars. Um, where you you don't know whether you should watch you know four five and six and then go back and watch one two three or whether you should watch one two three and then four five six and you know when when I first started in uh, to FRC um, you know I was playing all the way up we played 2007 uh, rack and roll and it had this this rack and you put you know these these uh, you know inflatable tubes up on the rack um, and then we had a logo motion in 2011 where you've got these you know straight uh, racks that didn't move and you're trying to score and now I'm coming back to toroid terror and saying oh my gosh this is the first game where you had you know the the, the tubes and you're scoring onto pegs. Um, and what's really cool about this game is that this scoring element, very similar to rack and roll, this scoring element moved, except in rack and roll, um, the robots, uh, I, I remember Bomb Squad had these, you know, uh, great holonomic, you know, wheels that were able to move the robot sideways. Here you didn't have that. So when this, when this goal moved, it was a huge deal. You know, then you had to move your robot. All the robots had to shift and it wasn't easy. You know, you only had uh, two uh, drill motors to be able to use your drivetrain. You didn't really have that holonomic system. Um, and and the the goals and the games and the way that things in this game actually changed a lot about how games were played from from this game moving forward. Definitely the um, the, the lazy Susan bearing um, uh, in the middle of that scoring pyramid. I mean, we've talked a lot about you know sight lines and such that that totally you're right. It will totally change um, your sight lines on where you're scoring um, and like basically prevents you from building any real muscle memory of like running a, a, a scoring cycle or something. Right. Uh, and one of the things that they did at the very beginning of the game um, is right as they're saying, you know, they, they didn't do three, two, one, go. They did one, two, three, go. 
but as the MC is leading off the field, you know, one, two, three, go, they're actually grabbing that, uh, that scoring element, you know, that, that pyramid, if you will, they're grabbing that pyramid and they're spinning it. And so literally your muscle memory of drive forward, drive left score, you know, there at the very beginning of the game. Yeah, exactly. Isn't there. And, and Chris, um, we, we talked a little bit about how there were in a previous year, there was at least two events. Um, but 97 is the start of the, the regional system, right? Right. Yeah. Regional started. Um, not sure how many, uh, there were, but that, you know, there was a big year for teams for team growth and you started having regionals. So, um, a little bit different type of competition, um, qualification type, you know, things and who's going to go play in the championship. Um, at this time, it was still U.S. first as well. Uh, so, you know, a lot of things, a lot of things changed. Um, there were also a lot of really good, I would say, kind of game design lessons learned from this game. Um, so one, you could detach things from your robot. So they would, um, you know, if you look, there's a huge tower there that's got even more, you know, more tubes on it than you would think could go on. Teams could detach pieces to put on there to help them with scoring. Um, you could also purposely flip over robots. So there were robots that were basically a wedge, would just drive under a robot and flip it over, and then that, you know, that team's out of the way for you. So that was something that got outlawed, you know, the following year. Um, the other kind of a kind of a subtle thing is the robots were big. They could be up to 36 inches square. And quickly people learn that a 36 inch wide robot won't fit through most doors. So or unfortunately, getting, not quickly, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't yeah. until not they were done enough. building their robot. <laughs> yeah, not quickly enough. So so then suddenly, you know, it's hard to get these robots in and out of some venues or even out of the room where the team built it, you know, at their school. Suddenly uh, won't fit through. Now, nobody had bumpers at the time, so it was just still 36, but it wouldn't, wouldn't fit through. Um, the other thing that was interesting with this game and, and now – part of a good game design is thinking about the flow of the game. A robot could go and block the human player station in this game. So effectively shut down one robot's ability to get game pieces and they could go park over there the entire match if they wanted. So um, one of the things that, you know, kept in mind today and important to keep in mind as you're developing a game is you don't want the game to be able to be stopped. So, you don't want to allow bottlenecks in the middle of the field that prevent robots going end to end if moving end to end is a big part of the game. And you don't want to block the ability for a robot to be able to go collect game pieces to be able to score. Um, but in this game, you could do that. There was nothing to prevent you from just parking and, and effectively taking that robot out of the game. Yeah, and speaking of human players, you know, one of the things, as I was watching match video, um, one thing that just, just made me just wince and pucker up um, every time it happened was when the robots were taking their arms, they were literally almost touching human players, right? There was no concept of safety here. Um, they were putting uh, the, the toroids, um, you know, the rings onto the robot, and literally it was right there. It's like, oh my gosh somebody's going to get hurt and fortunately you know there weren't any match videos of people getting hurt but oh my gosh you know that's not something you would see today um fortunately back then the robots were still fairly underpowered um but you can still do a lot of damage um so dealing with um you know the the way the human players interact and the way that safety is on the field you know we've come a long way in safety since then yeah, and definitely taking that into consideration and in game design and, and what the robots are capable of and how they can uh, interact with humans and, and whether they're going to be too tall to fall over when they're scoring their toroids on the top of the tower. Those are all, all very interesting things to look back at and say, oh, my gosh, I don't know if we could do that again. Right. And, and one thing that throughout the rest of these sessions we're going to see is that evolution of that, that safety net that's built around human players because human players are a big part of the first robotics competition. We're going to start seeing things in later sessions of things like disabled pads and different guardings <laughs> and all kinds of fun stuff that start to address this. As the robots get a lot more capable, um, the, the emphasis on safety grows with that. Um, so 
Um, moving along, uh, another year to Ladder Logic uh, in 1998, also known as the year of the great renumbering of all the teams, where um, teams actually earned a permanent team number that wasn't in order of registration anymore that they kept forever. Um, that happened all the way back in 1988. We still had an awesome game. Um, Chris, you want to take the lead on what Ladder Logic was all about? Yeah, and and um, just to, to build a little bit on that team numbering thing, that change came about because teams kind of went to first and said, hey, we would like to establish an identity. Uh, we would like for, for other teams to get to know us by our number, and we'd like to get, you know, maybe nice shirts and, you know, put numbers on the robot and do things. If your number's changing every year, you never know who, you know, who which team was and what they were doing. So um, that was a request from teams to say, hey, let me, you know, let me get a number and then keep that number. So, um, you know, up till then, you know, it, it was different. It was different every game. So this game, um, again, you know, we've got a six sided field. You've got a center structure there that kind of divides it into thirds. And uh, you had three balls of each color on the field, um, three balls of each color on the rails, and then three balls at each human player station. And this was another one where uh, you could de-score. Um, you only got points for game, you know, balls that were there at the end. So if somebody could put a ball up, you could knock it away. Um, it was interesting that in this game, the field itself became a deterrent to some level of defense because you had this big structure that robots had to get small to be able to go under to go and play defense. So um, when you were doing the one versus one versus one kind of thing, you know, you could maybe commit one robot to go and play defense on the better one. When it got into the kind of the elimination, the one versus one, it was it could take a lot of time for you to get small enough to go and play defense and then come back and, you know, get tall enough that you could score that element. So the field design itself was a big uh, challenge and even deterrent for teams playing defense. Yeah, and the scoring for this game was um, pretty different than anything that we had seen before, um, really because, you know, we in Toroid Terror, there was this, this concept of a multiplier, but here in Ladder Logic, the multiplier was literally everything. Um, you would you would take the the large or just the balls. They were all the same size. You would take your your team's ball and you'd put it in the center goal structure, and that was a doubler. Um, and so you could double your score. However, um, human players uh, almost just as I don't want to say just as bad, but just as influential as uh, 2009 uh, in lunacy, um, human players had their run of everything. Uh, robots would be descoring all, and the only way you could score actual points was to put the balls onto those rails, those you know the the, the arms of the flux capacitor, right, um, onto those rails. But immediately, as soon as you would score them, uh, the balls would be descored by another robot because you had literally two. You know, there was another. Robot robot right onto the side of you um, who would try to descore your balls. And so um, very quickly in a match, there would be no balls on that center structure. Um, and so you were trying to score in the middle there. And then uh, the human players were and, and other robots were trying to score into that center to get as many balls into the doubler as possible, because literally at the end of the game, it was almost a game of chicken. Um, at the end of the game, you were trying to then place one of your balls onto the rail and hold it there so that it couldn't be descored. Um, there were no rules about not touching the, the ball at the end of the game. You were trying to hold it there so that you would at least get those, you know, one, two or three points, um, which would then get massively doubled based upon what was in that center goal. So here in this game, though, those doublers were everything. And an important thing about um, kind of the, the subtle effects when thinking about this descoring mechanic and basically no game pieces being protected, um, Chris, is there's pathways for this kind of you know gameplay to get boring for an audience, right? Right. Yeah, for sure, because you see somebody score and somebody knock it off, and they score and they knock it off. So um, it, in some ways, you know, defeats the, the incentive for a team to be really good at scoring. Um, like Danny said, really, you want to be good at putting one up there and then holding it and making sure nobody could come and knock it out of the way, which is kind of boring to watch 
you know, if you're, if you're there and it's, you know, two minutes of score, D score, score, D score, and then hold it on the last three seconds, there's not a lot of excitement in watching that kind of game. So uh, you want to think about uh, those types of things with a game of what keeps it interesting to watch and what motivation do teams have to do different things during the game. Um, there were some other games, you know, further down the road, stack attack and things like that, where teams would spend, you know, 45, 50, 60 seconds building a tower and a team would come and knock it over and then all that work just disappeared. Um, again, you know, kind of a disincentive for teams to want to really work at, let's build a real tall tower if in a matter of seconds, all that work can be, you know, wiped away. So those are the kind of things you need to think about in the game is what keeps it uh, an incentive to score and what makes it an incentive for people to watch and, and want to know what's going on. Yeah, one of the, the funny things that came out of doing the research for this was uh, that the, the most of the fun to watch was actually the human players because the human players would be shooting uh, game pieces, you know, at that center structure. But not only were they shooting game pieces at the center structure, they were shooting game pieces at game pieces that were aiming for the, the center structure. So there was this sort of meta game where uh, human players would watch somebody throw a ball, and then they would throw a ball as hard as they can to deflect that ball away so that they couldn't score it in that center. And so then there was even you know, meta games in that of faking shots. So then somebody would, would waste one of their balls uh, in order to, to give you a chance to shoot it in. So that was, you know, that was kind of fun from an audience perspective, but from a team perspective, it, it really wasn't. Danny, one thing that I want to touch on uh, starting in this year that I, I notice when doing my research on these games is this is like the first game where we see something that resembles a modern field border um, prior to uh, ladder logic, they were all short, either pieces of PVC pipe, lumber, um, something really short. This is the first game where you start to see, like, uh, it's not three, three dimensional, not the right word, but where you see a more complex rail system as a containment device. Yeah, um, you know, Hexagon Havoc had a little bit of a rail, um, depending on what event that you were at. That was also in, in uh, Ramp and Roll had a little bit, you know, d again, depending on what event you were at, you, you had a little bit of um, some kind of a rail. It was sort of like those uh, 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 steel cables, you know, on the side of some highways like in Texas. Um, but yeah, there, there really wasn't a whole lot of a, of a field um, border. This was probably the first, like, what seemed like a uh, a very sturdy field border that, um, you know, really sort of stood out to people. Um, even though the robots here weren't very overpowered, um, I, I think that a lot of this field border was to, you know, contain, because, you know, two reasons for a field border. Uh, one is for safety. One is to contain robots. Um, and then the other one is to contain game pieces, right? Um, in, um, uh, in, in Maze Craze, you had uh, large uh, plexiglass walls really to contain you know all that corn on the field you didn't want that corn coming off the field so the containment of things on the field are, are very important um, and those those borders you know that's really why I think that's why this this field had a different border was really for containment moving on to 1999 where this is where we start seeing things exist that start still that still exist today this is the very first game where we had alliances. We moved away from 1v1v1 to actually having a team up with people. Um, that, that Chris, you talked a lot about um, some of the, the, the collusion and some of the stuff that happens here. Mm -hmm. How is this, like, this is really different now, right? Yeah, yeah, so this is big. So first, you know, it's, it's a big, big field again. It's um, square um, and, you know, a lot going on with, with the game pieces and with that center puck and things like that. But the biggest thing this year was the idea of an alliance. And first did not give any hint about alliances until the game was released. And people just went crazy of, you know, they're, they're ruining everything. This is the worst thing ever. I don't want to compete. You know, I don't want to have to rely on someone else. Um, this, you know, terrible mistake. Um, but, but it had kind of some really positive, but Maybe intended, maybe unintended, who knows. Um, but but what it did, you know, Danny talked before about how uh, careful 
people were about talking about their robot. Well, suddenly you needed to talk about your robot. You needed to help um, another team be successful in the field because they might be your partner. So you wanted to make sure everybody was able to play. You wanted to tell people what your robot could do. So if they were picking an alliance later, they might pick you, um, but also so you could work together in a match. You had to be honest about, hey, here's what I can do. What can you do? And then how can we play this game together? So um, it really opened things up and um, probably was kind of the, the, the precursor to all of the open discussion now with sharing designs and sharing you know, strategy and helping each other in the pit and which we all now think, well, that's just a good thing to do. Why wouldn't you do that? Well, prior to this game, you didn't do that because that was not being competitive. You didn't want to share all that. Now, suddenly, there's a real incentive to share that, and this this game kind of broke that broke that previous mold. Yeah, one of the the funny things about you know having alliances um, that we're still you know trying to to work out and fight out is um, backups. You know, when 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 do we sort of you know say okay, you gotta you you're the backup. Uh, oh, you don't want to play because your robot isn't ready to play. Oh, okay, so then who's the next backup? Um, in this particular game backups weren't even something that they initially thought of like they went all the way to the regional they got to a regional competition um and nobody had really brought up the concept of hey uh, there really needs to be a backup a third robot just in case somebody breaks down and so at regional events um they you know told everybody okay you're gonna pick three ro you're gonna pick two more robots wait we're gonna pick two more robots there was no requirement that that third robot had to play uh but they had to pick that extra robot um so there wasn't an actual it's sort of like championships right you got to choose your um your third robot um on the alliance so that that was actually pretty cool so in this game, you know, uh, Chris talked about there's a square field now, but we also get an interesting new game piece that we haven't seen before. Um, Danny, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, the puck. Oh my gosh, you know, the the puck was is probably the coolest and dirtiest thing that I have ever seen in my entire <laughs> FRC career. Um, the puck was amazing. It was this this thing that you could push around, and this puck was heavy. Like, it was probably 100 pounds just by itself. So robots being able to push this thing, not only push it, but potentially also pull it. So the puck was like a tug-of-war element, but it was also a king-of-the-hill element where robots were trying to get onto it. And, and if you could push that puck to the opposite side of the field, onto your opponent's side of the field, and you could get your robots on top of it, there was this this massive double effect, multiplier effect that was just devastating. You want, if you could get both your robots onto it, onto the other side of the field, you were pretty much done uh, with the field. So the puck was – it's an amazing element. And to be honest with you, before I had um, done research on um, these games – um, I didn't know what the puck was, and if you actually go and look at one of the videos um, for game design um, that we did, that we, we put, we did on Twitch, um, and you look at the 2019 um, uh, game design, like the template that we have, um, you'll actually see two pucks on the original template, and I didn't understand uh, when we were working on 2019. I understood like what the puck was supposed to do, um, or what the puck could. Would be, but I had no idea how the puck was actually used, or if the puck was even used in previous games. I, I didn't know. Then when I came and saw this, I'm like, ah, oh, that was a huge opportunity that you know we could we could potentially put a puck, because um, that puck was awesome. Just maybe it was just way overpowered, like way way overpowered. Yeah, definitely the the balance there. And and Chris, um, yeah. the other thing that teams had to deal with. Um, as we have a, a wonderful guest, uh, Simon, saying hello. Um, seems like it was a really, really weird game piece. Um, prior to this, all of the game yeah. pieces were uniform in some way. They were either a ball or, you know, a tube that was uniform in the sense of it, it was predictable, whereas this is a totally new thing, right? Yeah, this was, um, it was, they call them floppies. Uh, you had 10 of those per alliance, and you could sort of think of it as, you know, a pool tube, but it's made out of cloth 
and it's filled with um, like shipping peanuts, popcorn type thing, um, but it's not full. It's only partially filled, so it is floppy. It, it flips around. It's hard to pick up. It's hard to move around. It's hard to score, um, and you only got one in your kit apart, so um, if you tore it up, you were kind of in a mess, or you had to know somebody that could sew. Um, we did learn they gave real detailed instructions of how to make your own um, patterns and, you know, what material, and it was all readily available. But you had to know somebody that could uh, do some sewing if you wanted to have more than one of those game pieces to be able to play with. So, um, you know, a really different challenge there. Um, you know, think about some of the future years where we had inner tubes. As soon as it got deflated, nobody wanted to mess with it. Well, these were almost like deflated tubes all the time you had to play with. Yeah, one Another, of the cool aspect of, of this game piece is that it's covered in uh, loop side um, fastener, right? So like hook and loop, um, I, hopefully I'll get uh, mad props from Kate for not calling it Velcro. Um, th so <laughs> the, 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 uh, the loop side um, uh, material here. And so a lot of robots uh, will, would have the hook side on their robots and pick them up that way. So, you know, instead of like grabbing onto the game piece, they were just able to slap onto the game piece and pick it up. And I, I imagine that was a bit of a bit of a balance for teams, um, knowing that it was still it was still a carpeted floor, and having the the hook side on your robot. I mean, I can I can see at least in testing a lot of teams getting stuck to the floor, um, trying to pick these up with those mechanisms. Yeah, I, I have and, to assume and, that it was the same way with uh, 2019 as well, right? I mean, yeah, yeah totally. Yeah, the other thing that was that was good with this game. Um, kind of beneficial to teams is with with a four team, you know, match that meant a lot more matches in in a regular event because you know you had you had four teams playing at one time instead of three, so you were going to get back into that cycle quicker. So uh, the amount of plays you were getting uh, was starting to get bigger and bigger just based on the number of robots in a match at any one time. Yeah, and the the other element to this, you know, you you had to be able to um, uh, take your those game pieces and and raise them up. So you know, you you either between two inches and eight feet, and then above eight feet in order to be able to score, and that completely like changed your center of gravity. And so when you were you know raising these things up, you really didn't want to be touched. Um, you know, back in uh, two years prior, we had um, uh, put in rules um, in place to not allow, you know, these wedge bots of tipping over the, you know, pur purposefully uh, tipping over the robot by going underneath the robot and pushing them over. Um, but here we actually did see a lot of tipping. Um, and this was tipping sort of robots being robots, um, tipping them over by pushing them so that their center of gravity caused them to fall over. Um, and so that was also, uh, you know, outlawed at the end of this game, just sort of additional lessons learned um, here that with things that you just, you didn't expect to see, but had detrimental outcomes um, for the match. And I like how some of these rules um, that we kind of take for granted now, um, you know, actually have an established point where they started and right. uh, now they, it's just like, oh yeah, you can't tip anybody over. That's just how it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun to trace the lineage of, like, hey, this happened. That's why we don't do that. Um, which we'll, we'll actually see a little bit more lineage of not just rules, but um, robot parts show up as well in our next game, uh, Cooperation First, which um, turn of the millennium, year 2000. I don't know. One of the games that I, I like to look at a lot when thinking of robot-to-robot -robot interaction um, is, is this game. Um, Danny, do you want to lead us off with what Cooperation First was all about? Yeah, cooperation first um, is sort of the the very first I, I don't know I guess modern era field design um, where we had a very large rectangular field and we had some you know center element. One of the the elements that we we try to play with in game design is keeping the focus of the gameplay at 
you know, some some very specific area of the field so that your eyes don't, you know, it's not like playing a tennis match where you're looking over here, looking over here, looking over here. There's guarantee, you know, if you can look in the center of the field, you can see most of the action. And that's what, what actually happened here. Um, now, unfortunately, well, fortunately, this isn't like our current um, field configuration because all of the alliances are on one side of the field. You know, you've got both alliances, um, both the uh, the red and the blue set up in the same side of the field in the driver stations. One of the really cool elements of this is that um, they would actually flip flop every match um, to, to help with, with robots moving on and off. And, and it, it was a great cycle change, but the, the robots would run to the other side of the field or grab balls from their human players and then score them in the center of the field. And then, Hey, this is the first year of that chin up bar. So, uh, you know, something that you've we've seen time and time again since 2000. And and Chris, um, one of the other big changes that we saw in the year 2000 was um, the opening of mechanical allowances. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? You know, prior to, to this year's game, uh, you were really limited on what parts you can buy, where you could get them. Pretty much anything you used had to be either from the small parts catalog or available in the small parts catalog. Um, so this year... Uh, things were opened up. You could use extrusions. You could buy materials at at lots of different places. There were there were still limits of, you know, what what you could use, what was legal and not legal. But you could get those legal materials anywhere that was convenient for you. So you know, if your local hardware store had it, that was great. McMaster Car, you could order stuff that way. Um, things like that. So you weren't totally reliant on that one single source. So. Um, that was a, a real big, uh, real big change and a big help for teams. It really opened up the mechanical design. There was another really big change this year that um, kind of fits into the name, the, the cooperation. So this year's game, um, winning was was important, but more important were your ranking points, and you got ranking points based on the losing alliances score. So the winning alliance got a rank, got a multiplier, I think it was 3x, the losing score. So if you beat somebody 20 to 1, you might only get, you know, whatever it was, three, three ranking points. If you beat somebody 20 to 10, you got 30 ranking points. So the motivation there was you wanted to win, but you didn't want to shut someone out, and you wanted to figure out a way to let the match be close. Uh, so a real uh, interesting from a strategy perspective is winning, but ideally you'd want to win by one point to maximize your ranking score because, you know, ranking order uh, for alliance selection, all that was based totally on the losing alliances score. So um, really something different. Some people loved it. Some people hated it. It was another big, you know, big twist in things, but it was a different incentive. Um, so another example of, use an incentive of the game to drive behavior that, that you want. So in this case, first wanted a team to still want to win, but not annihilate the other alliance and not play so much defense that you shut somebody out. You wanted to let them play, let them score, and it was to your advantage to let them score. So a real different, real different twist. Uh, yeah, totally. Um, this this particular game, you know, not being um, win loss tie was was big, um, but this was probably one of the last um, games where d scoring was um, probably a, a big thing. Um, you know, if somebody was beating you um, by one point, being able to d score their game piece there at the last second was a huge thing because then you would win by that one point or two points, and then. You know, there would be this this wild swing of okay, and I get all these ranking points as well. So I think I think I'm pretty sure this is one of the last years that descoring a game piece was you know really a big thing in this game. Thing from a just from a design, you know, kind of rules and design standpoint. So bumpers were optional this year, so you could put them on if you wanted. Um, the rules around bumpers were pretty loose. Basically, the rules said has to be an energy absorbing material, which technically almost anything is energy absorbing material. Aluminum plate is energy absorbing. Steel, you know, all these things are energy absorbing to, you know, some 
definition of that word, what was intended was like styrofoam, you know, material, something, you know, padded like that. Um, but that wasn't really how it was written. Um, I don't know how many teams used bumpers that year. I think there were a couple years where they were optional before it became a requirement. But this was the first year that teams had that option if they wanted to try to protect the robot structure and all the electronics and things from uh, that, that defense that was going to be played. In the mechanical realm, the one thing I want to touch on um, with the, the rule book being kind of split wide open and you could get parts from wherever you wanted um, for the most part um, is I want to pick out one robot in particular. That's the chief Delphi robot from that year, team 47. That was like the first really good swerve drive robot. That's like the craze right now is everybody's looking at these holonomic drives and, and going after Swerve now, but like 21 years ago, they were the pioneers of this really good Swerve drive. Yeah, and I think if you look back, uh, first off, they had to make all their own parts, you know, so it was not only their design, but, you know, manufacture, make, assemble. Um, if you look at those, they're full of chains, you know, everything is, is hooked together and looped together. You know, you still had limits on what motors you could use and how many. So you had to be really particular there. Um, it's a long way, you know, we've come a long way today where you can buy the entire assembly and with four bolts and, and some code that you can download, you've got a sword drive robot. You know, they were figuring it out, you know, how do we do that? And there were, you know, a couple other teams that were starting to do that, to do that same thing. But um, that robot that year, I mean, that was a huge step um, and really something totally out of the box from a, from a design and then the ability just to implement that kind of system onto a robot was just really amazing. And they, they, they didn't do it for no reason. I mean, if you look at the design of the field where game pieces stack, they end up stacking, you know, in a line in the troughs. It made sense to have some sort of hauling on movement strategically in that game. Right, Danny? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, being able to, because descoring the game pieces, the, the higher the, the balls are up inside of the goal, you know, the easier it is to descore. So it, especially the way the trough was done, if you could distribute those balls across that trough, you had a much better chance of, of keeping and retaining your, uh, your lead, your small lead that you wanted to have. Totally. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a lot of really interesting games where a lot of things changed pretty quickly between the years of 92 and 2000. Um, we saw a lot of big changes, right guys? Yeah. Yeah. We saw a lot of changes and, and a lot of uh, a lot of positives, a lot of lessons learned, um, things that, um, you know, hopefully in, in future games, you know, they've they completely changed, hopefully for the better. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, it's interesting how, you know, the field changed significantly every year, um, you know, different sizes and shapes. Uh, the robots were growing and getting bigger and bigger, getting more and more powerful. Uh, more and more capability through use of electronics and controls and sensors and things. So uh, really, really a rapid evolution during that first 10 years of learning on the fly, figuring out what works. Um, I think that was also the, you know, kind of 99, 2000, there was this exponential growth in the number of teams being added. So that added to the number of events and the number of teams and the uh, more diversity in design because you had people from all over the country um, with all different levels and skills and capabilities coming into play. So a lot of things, a lot of things working in a positive way. Yeah. And the growth of first um, was, was huge, you know, coming up to uh, 2000, you had 250 teams at championship. Uh, you still only had one division at championship, but you had about 250 teams at championship, which, you know, it's, if that's about, uh, half of the teams that uh, normally play, um, then, you know, first is growing leaps and bounds at this point. Yeah, I really liked um, all of the games in this first session because of that rapid evolution you were talking about, Chris, um, where lots of different things were tried. I definitely really like that. And that's why we grouped this session together is because this is, these years are really like the, the birthplace of a lot of the core fundamentals that we, we, um, we take for granted. You know, the Alliance era, carpet on the field, starting to have a legitimate field border, um, all of those things that, you know, are modern to us or like things we just assume are things weren't always that way. Um, right. And it's, it's definitely fun to see the lineage of all of those, those sorts of things here. Um, so that's going to wrap up all of our games for session one. Um, 
Uh, on behalf of Liz and myself, I really want to thank uh, both Danny and Chris for taking the time out of their very busy lives to come and chat robots with us. Um, this has definitely always been uh, a blast to you know have you guys as friends, but also be able to talk robots on, on a webcast with you guys. It's been great. Thanks for inviting us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Um, also want to thank um, some people in the background as well, uh, First Indian Robotics. Um, namely um, Matt Malinak for uh, coordinating this entire event, uh, as well as uh, Brad Thompson for uh, being the behind the scenes person to make this all look pretty and make us all sound intelligent. So that's it for session one. Um, session two will be covering the years of 2001, 2008, where things get totally turned on their head and then back again and refined a little bit to what we kind of call modern first robotics competition. Um, thank you for tuning in. Um, we had a ton of fun um, bringing you know, a bunch of really fun and uh, strange history about the first Vice Cops to you. Um, with that, we'll sign off and we'll see you for episode two. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us as well for the Q&A portion here of our uh, History of Game Design broadcast. Um, we're lucky enough that both Chris and Danny uh, were available for the live Q&A part. Um, Liz as well is joining us here. Um, and we're basically just gonna take the questions you have from chat um, and try to answer them the best we can. Um, if you have more, feel free to keep putting them in chat there as well. We're, uh, we're live actually here reading the chat um, as we go. In real life. In real life. We are real actual people. <laughs> um, um, and uh, I, I, again, like thanks to, to Brad and Matt for putting that, that, that section together. It looked really good. We were kind of uh, enjoying how much more intelligent we looked <laughs> when uh, we were watching the, the broadcast. Um, we're going to dive right into the questions here. We'll be here probably until about nine at the latest here um, with questions we got from chat. Um, and the, the first question we have in chat um, that we is an everyone question um, is what is your favorite game and why? I'm going to send this one to Danny first. All right. Uh, you know, I've always been a huge fan of 2009, 2005 triple play, uh, triple play with the game with the Tetras, um, I, I assume I can choose any game and not just the first, you know, the first nine. Um, but 2005 um, had the Tetras. Um, it was a huge mechanical challenge. It was the very first um, game that had um, the, the vision challenge in it. Uh, and and I, that just was the game that, that I fell in love with. Yeah, I think we're going to bring that one up a couple times in some of our later questions too. But uh, Chris, what's your favorite game and why? Um, so actually, I probably have two. One I saw, one I didn't. Um, Double Trouble in 99, because it introduced the whole concept of alliances. And I think that really opened things up for teams with, um, you know, sharing information and scouting and like, you know, referred to more honesty in the pits because you were, you know, trying to trying to help people along the way. And then I think my, uh, my other one would be 2001, Diabolical Dynamics. Um, the reason is that's the first game I ever saw live. Um, we were in Florida for vacation, heard about this thing called First going on at Epcot, went and, you know, thought we'd swing in for 15 minutes and leave. And, you know, five hours later after watching matches and having no clue what was going on, <laughs> just, you know, kind of sucked in. Everything kind of, kind of grew from there. So that would probably be my most favorite because it was the first one I ever saw. I had nothing to do with the game or the robot or anything else, but, you know, just seeing if that's what brought me in. So that's like uh, five hours and how many years later he's still here <laughs> and uh, yeah, doing yeah. this, right? Yeah, oh, that's super. I didn't, I didn't know that, Chris. That's, that's actually super cool. <laughs> um, Liz, what, what's your favorite game and why? Okay, so I do have a special place in my heart for 2005, like Danny was saying. Um, 
but I think also I really enjoyed playing 2016 as a drive coach just um I really enjoyed feeling like you were attacking a castle. I thought you really felt that when you were playing that game. Mm-hmm. I, I have to agree with you on 2016 mm-hmm. also being the top of my list. Like 2005 is a game that like was right before my career. And it's a game I really wanted to play um, and like have rose colored glasses about it. But like 2016, I like it because it scaled well for all events we saw. You know, week one through the championship were exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a deep dive coming up in a few episodes about it, but yeah. I, I have to agree with you on, on 2016. So um, moving on to our next question as well. Um, ooh, this one's a spicy one. What game piece or challenge would they like to see in a game? Chris, what do you think? Oh, what game piece? Um, well, that's a tough one. Mm-hmm. I think something that's a... Um, like a really weird shape. So the Tetras, you know, the, the year of the Tetra, that game was was really cool. Um, so, you know, something like that, maybe on a smaller scale that you have to mess with, something that's kind of hard to grab, hard to get a hold of. Um, you know, we've done a lot with cubes and round things and different sizes. Um, I always wondered about a football just because of the unique kind of weird shape, but um, even like a, you know, a Tetra, that you've got to do something different with. I think something like that would be cool. Danny, what do you think? Uh, uh, hands down, a football. Um, the football is an incredibly difficult game piece to deal with. It doesn't seem like it's a difficult game piece to deal with, but honestly, it is it is diabolical in how difficult it is because you know you can, you can pick it up, sort of, depending on what orientation it's in. Um, you could shoot it depending on what orientation, you know, there's so many different ways you've got to be able to index that game piece Um, that, you know, normally when we do game design, you know, we're looking for game pieces that uh, maybe have one degree of difficulty to be able to, to deal with Um, the football has like two or three degrees of difficulty in, in dealing with. And it's, it's diabolical in that, you know, I could probably design a game that, um, you, you've got to, you know, just deal with the football, just dealing with the mm-hmm. football. And I bet most teams would, would fail the first time they did it. Um, it's, but, but I definitely want the football. What do you think, Liz? Mm. I don't know. Um, I'm thinking maybe some sort of like puzzle piece thing that could, you know, has to fit together with another element. I don't know. I haven't really thought that one out too yeah. far, but uh, the, that'd be cool. The half-baked thought that I've had, um, for a couple of years now would be a long rigid cylinder um, as the game object, because that in the same vein of a football, you know, it's not uniformly shaped and it is difficult. I mean, yes, we had pool noodles in, in 2015 as a game piece, but I'm thinking something like rigid, like a hard plastic tube. Pick up sticks or yeah. Like yeah. a pickup sticks game where you, I mean, it's difficult, but like one of the scoring um, pathways is uh, like you, you can pick it up horizontally, but it has to change orientation to pass through its scoring location. Mm-hmm um is is one that shows up in my brain as like is this too hard yes all right let's do it (laughs) um that shows up a lot um okay here's a here's an impactful question from uh renee becker blau the wonderful renee um what problems do you enjoy solving in the world danny what do you think wow um the ones that i enjoy solving are probably process problems where you definitely, you know, as an engineer, I see a lot of people doing things and I see that they're doing them inefficiently, right? Um, I would love to turn all problems into a small shell script, right? I mean, automation, automate the world, right? Um, And so I really enjoy, you know, tackling a process problem and finding a better way of doing things. Uh, Yeah, I, I definitely jive with that. Chris, what do you think? I really like problems that there's not a not a single solution. There's not a clear um, where you've got to make you know trade offs of two or three, maybe two or three competing good solutions and figure out which one's the best overall, or maybe some combination of a couple. Um, and and I really like you know attack tackling a problem that nobody's really been able to figure out before. You know we we got to figure out how to do this. Nobody's done it. What what can we do? What's it sort of like? and then kind of go from there. What do you think, Liz? 
Um, I think I like um, problems that I uh, personally can contribute to. Um, I really like uh, presenting um, visual, doing visual presentations and presenting, um, uh, like at Andy Mark, I do a lot of assembly instructions and things like that. So helping to, you know, work in a group and, and present a problem or a solution mm -hmm. um, in that way. What about you? Uh, I, I really have to agree with Chris. I, I really like problems that have multiple valid solutions. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's part of one of the reasons that, you know, uh, first of all, this is so engaging for, for me on a personal level is because there's so many valid solutions. Mm -hmm. um, and like the hard part of trying to pick which of those solutions is best for you is my, like my single favorite part of those kind of problems for sure. Huh. Okay. Um, a question for our guests specifically, and I'll, I'll fire this one over to Chris first. What, in your opinion, was the greatest evolution in robots from one single season to the next? Wow. That's a hard question. Wow, that's a deep, that's deep. Yeah. So I don't know, I'm not positive which season it was because it happened kind of before I was involved, but I think the year that the, basically the, the allowable materials opened up, um, you know, one point and, you know, before I was involved, everything you used had to come from the small parts catalog. You were really restricted on materials and where you could get things and what you could do. And the year that that flipped, I think just kind of opened up so much because that huge constraint went away. And just that's what opened up options like Andy Mark and options like Vex and all those things that, you know, 15 years later, we take for granted. You didn't have those options at that time. And I think all of those capabilities, that that single act of kind of opening up what you could use really just, you know, kind of kind of created a you know a huge change that we're still still benefiting from. I'm just not sure what year that happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah, kind of have to agree with you on that one. Danny, what do you think? Yeah, along the same vein as Chris, I I really liked, um, and I, I think it was between 2016 and 2017, it could have been earlier, um, when we opened up the, uh, the motor limitations, um, when teams could actually do literally whatever they wanted, um, especially with the, their drivetrains, and didn't have to worry about, you know, the motor consequences of it. Um, it really, I mean, you know, the, uh, I remember back in the day, like way back in the day when 118 had their, um, V6, you know, they were using six Sims on a drivetrain. Oh my God. Um, but now, you know, uh, uh, six Sims on a drivetrain is like, is that all you're using? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there, there's so, so different, you know, ways of, of handling, handling it now. Um, it just, it, it exploded the, 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 the problem space. Yeah, definitely. Okay, we're gonna do a, a quick lightning round here, um, where we're we're all gonna answer three questions kind of kind of quickly. Um, first one, start with Danny. What was your favorite end game? Favorite end game, lightning round. Um, probably. Oh my god. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, we'll come back to you, Chris. Yeah, come back. Come back. Well, now I got to look and see what, I don't remember what the game was. Um, come back to me. And are these, uh, are these any year? We can do any year? Any year. Okay. Uh, I'm going to say 2012. Oh. Was a great balancing. Sorry, Nick. Took my answer. Again. Yes. I, I agree about 2012. The drama at the end of the match. Um, hmm. <laughs> I now have to be uh come back to as well okay all right come back come to me then yeah danny what was yours all right 2017 climbing the ropes that was my favorite in game i know people hate that but the touch pads were were such a a big thing from i got to design the touch pad yeah. uh, maybe i shouldn't have said that but um i got to design it it was fun um i loved the climbing loved the you know illumination i loved how at the end of the game you knew what the you know when it was over with and and there was no question as to whether or not you had, as long as it was working correctly, <laughs> that, that you had pressed it correctly. So it was definitely 2017. I, I know in the same vein, 
uh, there were some, um, we're going to cover this a bit more in our later sessions about, about 2011, but the concept of the, like, having to deploy a separate robot in a race, like, oh, yeah. that concept in 2011 was very cool. I, I do think, my personal opinion, the execution could have been different, but, like, the concept of deploy a separate robot, like, not a tape measure or whatever, like we saw in 2002, like, that was super cool on the surface. Chris, what do you think? That was cool, too. All right. <laughs> cool. OK, next one. Chris, what's your favorite game piece? Oh, oh God, I think probably the Frisbee. Uh, just because it was so different. It's like, where did that come from? Um, first look at it, and you think there's no way you can shoot these things. There's no way you can be accurate. And then you got teams firing them the whole length of the field and hitting 100%. Um, I think just th that was really cool. Liz, what do you think? Um, I'm also going to steal your answer again um, and say the gear from 2017. I just thought, you know, that was super cool and different and like it meshed like a real gear. It was awesome. Yeah. Um, the reason why that's also my favorite game piece <laughs> is because I got to work on the design of that game piece, <laughs> which was super cool for me to have that external experience. Yeah. All right, Danny, what was your favorite? All right, um, because you've already said gear, because that was honestly my favorite game piece. You're welcome. <laughs> just for all the reasons, um, but my my second or, or tied favorite game piece was a Tetra from 2005. Yeah. 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 Big, heavy, yeah. crazy thing. <laughs> and they just, they stacked in any orientation. They stacked. It was it was an open thing. It You had so many different ways you could manipulate it. Oh, love that game piece. Okay, and our last question in our lightning round. What is the best field shape? I'll lead on this one. My answer is a meme. Um, I think hexagons, because hexagon, hexagons are the best agons. If you're not a CGP Grey fan, you need to go follow that channel. Um, just hexagons are the best agons. They stack well, it's the best shape. That's the only answer. But yes, uh, Chris, what do you think about field shape? A big rectangle, because it gives you the most actual usable field uh, for everything you want to do. Danny, what do you think? Am I allowed to say a field shape that I that we haven't seen yet, but but I so want to see? Yeah. A Y. I want to see a Y shaped field. I want to see three alliances on a Y shaped field. Oh, that would be neat. I I would love to see that. <laughs> I like, so want that. Yes. Breaks so much constructs about like what is a field now. I yeah. <laughs> I, I really what like is that. Real, what is a field? Okay, that was um, the definitely the fastest lightning round I've ever been a part of. Um, so, all right, Danny, here, here's, a, here's a serious question specifically for you. So can you talk a little bit more about the 1v1v1 era um, and maybe some of the like implications of teams maybe like inadvertently creating alliances and such? Yeah, um, you know, you see a lot of a lot of those same game characteristics even today, um, you know, when you've got, uh, well, Okay, maybe when it was two v two, it was more more like that. Um, but I mean, you've got th this concept of okay, I'm going up against you know the other alliance, the other team, and I'm going to slow down you know the the progress that their best robot is making, right? And and maybe the two best robots that are making um, when it was one on one, uh, one on one on one. If you went to go slow somebody down because you didn't want them to score so much, that completely left open the other guy who was just completely, um, you know, not not being defended because you had two robots that were going at it, and that's probably you know just there's no there's no room for a third wheel in, yeah, you know, it's it's relationship right one on one. Come on, you got a third wheel, the third wheel just goes off and does what they want, and then that third wheel ends up winning. So. Um, you know, in, in cases where you're playing and you know you can't beat the other team, you're just going to go and pick on them. And that's that's most likely, you know, what happened with the majority of the cases is they went to go pick on them. And guess what? The other team um, who didn't get picked on got the benefit from it. Yeah, definitely at a, an interesting time in, you know, FRC games on history that, I mean, probably a lot of people watching this, this chat are like, prior to today, um, or watching the stream, didn't, didn't know it was a thing. And we kind of take, you know, the 3v3 for, for granted these days. But, um, okay, another question. This one, I'm going to, this isn't everyone question, but I'm going to start with Chris. 
Um, what is your favorite human player role from any of the games that we've played in FRC? I think it would have to be Steamworks because uh, the human player is in the middle of the field. Uh, they had to work together, you know, with, with another one that had a key role of, you know, getting the gears, putting things in place, making things turn, um, you know, throwing the ropes out, doing all those. So I think just um, they were kind of kind of front and center um, and could either make or break an alliance if you had someone in there that, you know, didn't know what they were doing or just kind of somebody said, hey, we need a human player. Um, but if you had somebody that was really in touch with what was going on, was probably the most level of engagement we've had for a human player that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Dan? Yeah. Um, you know, I have to take that there's two two games that the human player pretty much did the same thing. Um, and that was in 98 with Ladder Logic and 2004 with First Frenzy raising the bar. Um, in both of those games, the human player was used to actually shoot the ball like a, a basketball into some kind of a cylindrical goal, um, either in the middle of the field or close to the middle of the field. And that really brought in you know, a lot of teams, um, a lot of, of players um, who may not ever been involved in FRC, uh, you know, your, your basketball kids on, you know, your basketball team, they could come in and play or, you know, just that level of involvement. You know, the robots still had to usually get the, at least in 2004, the robots would get your human player, those, those game pieces, but your human player, you know, was there shooting. And what, what I loved about that versus like, you know, the debacle of 2009 uh, was that the human player didn't score all the stinking balls. You know, there was a very specific and very isolated, you know, thing that you did and the scoring on it was important, but it wasn't like everything. Yeah. I kind of have to agree with you on that one. Liz, yeah. do you have a similar answer? <laughs> I mean, yes, I am totally a hundred percent biased because I was uh, a human player in 2004 and got to actually play that game, which was, a lot of fun to do. Um, but I think also um, I really like the human player dynamic in 2014 where um, the robots ended up passing the balls to the human players. And um, you know, even in the highest levels of play that was successful. And also in the lower levels of play where maybe the robot couldn't, um, couldn't pass off um, exactly the way they wanted to. So um, they utilized the human to do it a little bit more precise uh so i thought that was an awesome dynamic what, what do you think I, I think mine is where the human player was a proxy for a bigger thing um i'm gonna have to go with the, the specific human player role of power up specifically when they were the like vault attendant or yeah. whatever the you know official name was yeah. because of the amount of impact that like role had yes it was like part of a whole alliance group you know using that that role but how much impact that one person had on you know whether you were going to force right now or boost now um, mm -hmm. to take full advantage, there's a lot of strategy around that. Yeah. Um, being a strategy nerd, I, I really like that role. <laughs> um, also caused a lot of um, you know panic attacks uh, because those human players got to be perfect, right? So and we'll talk about that in the later yeah. sessions. But um, yeah, I, I agree. Having you know a human player in that position um, that was like really focused and knew what was going on was like yeah. super key. So a lot of these See, until, until you said power up, I totally swore you were going to say 2010 breakaway um, <laughs> because the the human player had such a big effect because of dogma yeah. and Thank the you. number of points that got taken away from you because of the you know that the whole timing thing of the dogma and how nobody I, I swear to god nobody could use the trident at any of the games that i was at um they just apparently you know were, just didn't know how to use it um and and that had a huge effect on you know, getting those game pieces back on the field and getting the game going. So, but I, I could have swore you were going to do 2010 and then you immediately kind of changed over and I went, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we've, we've talked, like all of our answers have been about like engagement, right? And of that human player. So Danny, this is a hot button question. Um, both, both of you guys are going to answer this, but I'm going to start with Danny. Um, what do you personally think is the right amount of involvement for a human player in a game? Yeah, that's a, th that is a definitely a hot button um, question. Um, personally, I feel that the human player should be allowed to help the robots, you know, some kind of an assist on the robot 
to help the robot do what what they're supposed to do. You know, very similar to um, uh, to, you know 2014 and um, uh, taking the ball off the pedestal and and putting it onto the field. Um, I I really loved. Um, I was one of the people who helped um, put advocate for the the human player on the airship, um, and that was a way to help the robots be able to score um, because. Otherwise, we were trying to have the gears go onto like pegs on the airship, having the robots place it on pegs. Can't do it. So either introducing the game piece or getting that game piece, that last leg um, into something so that it looks cooler than what it really is. Um, I, Yeah, I, I think that's that's about where um, for the human player, I kind of kind of, you know, I, I think the game should be for the robots, right? The robots should be playing the game, and the humans should be um, the the ancillary element um, that that really helps the robots play the game, but doesn't necessarily play it for the robots. Okay. Seems reasonable. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, I think it's a it's a real fine line because you know one of the one of the things about uh, Steamworks, you know, the human player was a big part of that, um, but I think if you get to where human wires too much one i mean it is a robot competition you want to keep the robots there but also um, the pressure or the pain you could put onto a student if you know if there's one thing they can do that can absolutely flip a game especially if it's obvious they did or didn't do something you know i think that's a huge amount of pressure to put on a high school student um, you know to oh they missed that shot so we lost the match kind of thing or they forgot that one piece, you know, it's sort of like um, in that game coming off the airship too quick, that was mm. the huge penalty. You know, that was that was a huge, huge amount of pressure put on to a to a student. You know, so it's finding that right balance of an important part and as Danny said, a supporting part, but not the key to the game. It makes makes a bunch of sense. Um... Okay, let's have some fun a little bit here. Um, let's move on to some not robot questions for a minute. Um, this one's specifically for Danny, because I know he has an opinion on this. What is your favorite brand of paper towels and why is it Brawny? <laughs> this is not an endorsement, it, by the way. It, it definitely is Brawny. Um, Brawny is the best paper towel. Uh, it, it's never let me down. Um, and I've cleaned up stuff from, you know, I don't even want to say the, the <laughs> nastiness that I've cleaned up, but all the way to, you know, small things, big things to small things, Brawny's handled it all. Um, and it's, it's taking a lick and then keep on ticking. It, it's, that's the paper towel. You know, you, one of the things you, you learn when you get on your own is you, you can, you can buy the generic of everything except diapers, paper towels, and toilet paper. Those are the things you don't buy generic. I, I agree about don't buy generic of those things. Uh, I think also um, aluminum foil lands in that lot for me as well. Yeah. Um, oh. Like generic store brand aluminum foil is very thin. <laughs> um, and if you're, you're kind of grilling, it leads to a kind of a sad time sometimes. Um, yeah, that's, I, I, I've never like had the specific affinity um, to a one brand of, um, paper towels, but that makes a whole bunch of sense. Um, I'm also the kind of person who probably reaches for a shop towel first before I reach for a paper towel, I think. Um, maybe it's because the hands are always full of robot grease or whatever. But um, and, then, and then somebody asked this question of, does Flex Seal make toilet paper yet? Um, and uh, that's kind of horrifying to, to kind of think about <laughs> of what product that, that would be. Um, all right, so let's, let's get a little more serious. Um, feels like a lot of these questions are um, actually kind of kind of Danny questions. Um, but I'm, I'm curious to hear what, what Chris has on this one as well. Um, how does audience, I assume, you know, the existence of the audience in this question impact designs? Do you focus on things that make it easier for the audience or more focus on the teams and robots themselves? Um, Danny, like this is, this is a big, you know, kind of teeter totter you have to pull, right? Massive mm -hmm. teeter totter, massive, massive teeter totter. And we've gotten guidance on that um, in, in so many different ways, you know, um, Woody had a huge um, view on that. Dean has a huge view on that. Um, the game designers um, every year have a huge view on that. And so it's, that's, 
really, really difficult, you know, and um, I, I love that Dean, you know, has come out and said that first is the best kept secret um, in, in all of robotics, um, not intentionally kept best secret, but, you know, it's the best kept secret. We need to get more people, um, you know, more, more outsiders in the stands. Um, but, you know, when it comes to the audience, we, we generally tend to, to design our games so that, you know, um, the audience doesn't get completely lost in what's going on. Um, I remember I used to play um, in, in Texas Best. I know we're not talking about other gaming competitions, but they had this game that was amazing. It was this uh, chemical game, and you, you took all these chemicals, and you were building, you know, other, you know, you're building molecules, and then more complex molecules, and you had to have five of these, and three of those, and two of those, and it was a huge math game, um, and it was really interesting, but anybody watching that game was like, oh, what's going on? I have no idea. Um, so that's definitely something you have to be very careful of. And then, Chris, you have the, you know, other perspective of being you know a long time drive coach um you know a long time mentor for, for 234 um like where do you stand like would you would you rather have a game that is more interesting like or you know engaging for you as a robot person or as um somebody watching in the stands like where do you where do you land on this <clears throat> i think it's it's sort of like Danny said it's a real balance um obviously it's got to be interesting and exciting for the drive team and the people right there on the field for what they're doing, but a huge percentage of the team is up in the stands watching. You know, there's five or six kids, students, mentors on the field. Everybody else is watching what's going on. It has to be exciting to watch for them and easy to follow and know how their team is doing, especially, you know, if you have newer members or you've recruited new members to come in. Also for people in the community or families to come in and be able to watch and pretty quickly understand, at least at a high level, what the play is and be able to see what's going on. You don't, you know, you don't want things to happen kind of on the back side of things to where you don't have a clue, you know, what's that robot doing? Is it good or bad? Um, then I think the other, and um, I've been, you know, part of a couple of design things with, with Danny in the past, real-time scoring so that you don't have to wait a minute and a half or two minutes at the end to see who won. You don't necessarily have to know exactly who won right at the end, but you ought to know, hey, it looks like this alliance is ahead or that alliance is ahead. Sometimes it'll flip quickly, mm -hmm. you know, based on something, but you want to have some general feel as to kind of what's the score doing as you progress. Yeah, that that all makes a, a ton of sense. That That balance is really hard, but when it's like, hit perfectly those games are just magical um to both watch and participate in um all right so in the in the realm of panic inducing things um what is your favorite field timeout song uh and why is it cotton high joe is the way the question was <laughs> but uh i'm just gonna go with what's your favorite field timeout song uh chris i have no clue <laughs> he's too busy uh making sure his team's ready to go because they're you know perpetually in the finals yeah. so it, it <laughs> just all it just yeah, it's just all kind of a blur, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I like almost all the music. Um, I think Mr. Roboto is worn out to the point where when I hear it on the radio driving, I switch channels, kind of thing. <laughs> um, you know, so I don't, I don't really have a favorite. I don't, I don't, I wouldn't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna jump in here and say my favorite field timeout song is the one that. I actually have the opportunity to hear and recognize if I'm field side as an FTA. Um, Cause if I don't know what field timeout song is on, that means I'm in a state of trying to fix whatever problem is on the ground. <laughs> um, whereas if yeah. it's like a field timeout between semis or whatever and things are running smoothly and I actually hear what's going on, I like those. <laughs> um, Danny, what do you think? You know, it, I, I personally like field timeout songs that gets everybody involved and gets everybody dancing and singing and, you know, having fun, getting, getting in just, there in in the moment and the only song that i can think of that um other than the cotton eye joe which i don't want to say cotton eye joe uh, that gets everybody from like referees to team members to judges that's the cupid shuffle i mean honestly everybody can dance to that they like tell you what to do yeah, yeah. exactly the instructions are given to you liz do you have a favorite right. um i have a least favorite does that count yeah sure <laughs> 
I'm not like a big dance person, but um, I do have a quick story of when um, my team left their um, standard on the field, you know, their flag from uh, 2016. Um, oh. Some of us here in Indiana um, decided it was a good idea to make um, the drive team come back and have to dance or do something, spin a wheel um, with a kind of a punishment in order to get their standard back. Um, and so I had to go um, on the field and dance the chicken dance. Um, and I dedicated it to Mr. Danny Diaz, who was uh, <laughs> doing support for our event at the time of some sort. So that's, um, I'm not a big dance or person who does that kind of stuff, but it was a fun time. <laughs> that was the, the best, best thing ever. I'm telling you. <laughs> Okay. Um, here's one that I, I'm not sure is serious. Maybe it is. Um, why doesn't everyone use a mobile turret, like a removable turret, like 254? Chris, why isn't everybody 254? Yeah. Okay. So I actually, I can answer that because we've tried it. Uh, so I can, I can tell why. So one, you know, a, a turret, movable turret is a really significant engineering challenge to design and then to build so that it works and works smoothly. It takes a lot of you know, capability just to, to get the design part right. Um, you have to have really good motor control to be able to move it just a little bit left and right and not have you know, slop going back and forth. And then you know, when 254 and others take that and even make it to where it's tracking and moving tracking, then that's a whole nother level of integrating you know, some vision and some other things into that logic to make that turret move. Um, it is really awesome when it works. Um, our experience in the past has been when we've tried that, what we've usually found is for us, we're better off just locking that shooting mechanism and letting the driver be the turret because they can move quicker than we could make control logic to do it. Um, otherwise, the, the, the robot and the control is trying to move and track to something and the driver gets nervous and anxious and moves, well, then that throws the whole thing off. So we've tried it a few times and ended up locking it down and, and just, you know, basically having a fixed turret, so to speak, if, if that is even something that exists. Yeah, we've, yeah. we've found, at least on, on our team, that we, we have the ability to build a turret it is difficult for our team's resources to build a turret and to build the rest of the robot to be just as good as that turret deserves, right? I mean, it's a pretty big, as you said, Chris, it's a pretty big resource draw um, to get something like that right. Um, and it, like, it, it just, it's really hard to get something good enough to warrant usage. Um, anybody can right. build a turret, but it's one that's good enough to warrant its usage is, is really the hard part. Um, so it, it's, it's 902. We're a little bit over time here. Um, again, I want to thank both Danny and Chris for joining us here uh, for some, you know, late night robot talk here as well and some, some Q&A. Um, as always, it's really great to see you guys. I also want to thank Liz for joining uh, me as well and also Brad and Matt behind the scenes making all of this happen. Um, so that's it for tonight. Um, we, uh, we really appreciate all of you for tuning in and kind of listen to some history of game design and then some fun Q&A after that. Um, our next session will be this coming Thursday, that's February 18th um, at uh, 7 p.m. till about 9 p.m., same kind of time frame, same place, same channel. Um, and we're gonna have uh, guests, our, our guests are gonna be Andy Baker and Amanda Bissett. I'm really excited for that session. There's a lot of really good games uh, coming up on that one, but... Um, for everybody here, um, thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you on Thursday. See y'all. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. <laughs>